Well, listen, we're in the book of Revelation this evening, and if you'll open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 20, and stand with me and let me read the verses that we're going to attempt to go over this evening. I trust we'll be able to accomplish that. And uh, if you do not have a Bible, if you'll raise your hand, please, one of the ushers will get you a Bible, and you'll be able to enjoy the Word of God that much more. Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Let me pause here. That's as far as I hope to get tonight, but I'd like to read the rest of the chapter to you. It's so short, and I'm certain you'll enjoy it. Verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog to, Gog to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into a lake of fire. Well, let's pray, please. Well, Father, thank you again for the word of God, which is your bread of life for us. Your word is what gives us life. Your word is what strengthens us in our new life in Christ. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Your word corrects us. It 
rebukes us, it encourages us, it instructs us, it builds us up. And we thank you for your word, Lord, which you use to draw us closer to you. We also, Father, thank you so much for the presence of your Holy Spirit who dwells inside of each one that is a child of God this very night. And we ask, Lord, that he would work in us to take the things of Christ and to glorify them in our lives and to give us understanding that we might grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, chapter 20 is an important chapter in the Bible. In fact, it's one of the most important chapters in the Bible. It describes about four different things. One is it describes the kingdom age or the thousand-year reign. It also records the uh, binding up of Satan for a thousand years, the ultimate punishment of Satan forever and ever, and it details for us what is called the great white throne judgment, and it warns us of something called the second death. We're going to, as mentioned, probably just, I'd like to cover just these first six verses. They're so rich, um, and so we'll concentrate on those this evening. But you'll notice in verse 1, John says, then, or you could say, after. So he says, then I saw, or after, what I have seen. And just very briefly, the word revelation means, it's not revelations as it's often called, it's one word without an S on the end, revelation, the book of revelation. It means the unveiling of Christ who was revealed to John in the first chapter and is revealed to us specifically in the, in the 19th chapter as he makes his second coming to the earth. Uh, we tend to think of the book of Revelation uh, merely as a detailed picture of these horrible, never-before-seen events, which in fact, they never have been seen. They are horrible. They never will be repeated again. But we tend to kind of focus on that. But really, uh, the more proper way is to recognize that this book is the unveiling of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. As he spoke to his seven literal churches in chapters two and three, uh, with messages that apply all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we see what Jesus is doing in bringing the answer to the prayer which has been prayed for millenniums. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is the next part? Thy kingdom come. And the word kingdom means the reign, R-E-I-G-N, the reign and the rule of Jesus Christ on the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this, uh, so this book is the Lord Jesus Christ being unveiled, bringing about the wrath of God on this world leading up to, and it's the wrath of the Lamb of God, by the way, leading up to the literal second coming of Christ and his establishing of his kingdom on the earth. And so without even looking back there, let me just uh, briefly mention to you that in chapter 18, we saw the very last part of the wrath of God, the destruction in chapter 17 and 18 of uh, both the religious system, this one global type of unified religious system being destroyed, also this uh, global economic system under the leadership of the Antichrist, that being destroyed. And so uh, all of what Satan 
has done to develop and put in place his false Christ, the Antichrist, all of that is finally brought to an end. And it's, it's actually 17 and 18. And then in chapter 19, what we see are two things. In the first half of the chapter, we're brought up into heaven, and we see the worship of the saints in heaven worshiping God and thanking God for what he has done in bringing that wrath upon the earth because they, they even state your kingdom is now coming. And earlier in the book of Revelation, those saints who were martyred, who were under the throne of God, they're saying, how long, O Lord, how long will all of this go on? And so the joy and the jubilation in heaven is the recognition, hey, listen, we are coming right down to the end now. In fact, you and I, we believe, and we'll touch on this this evening, that we will be in that group uh, making those, uh, we're participating in that worship. There's also actually three things. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb. We as Christians are called the bride of Christ. He is our bridegroom, and though we're engaged to him, as it were, the consummation of our marital relationship will take place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Christ himself will serve us, if you can imagine. I mean, all we have are examples of uh, a, you know, uh, a food server coming up and saying, would, would you like some water or tea to drink? And they give you menus and, you know, they have a little thing over their hand and all of that. And, and um, are you with me? Okay, well, Jesus is going to serve us. And, and I think he's not going to say, would you like water or tea? I think it's all going to be squared away. He'll know exactly what's happening. But if there's something special that's not on the menu, I'm sure you can ask him. But the marriage supper of the Lamb, imagine our Lord serving us, our personal contact with him. And then the third final thing that happens in chapter 19, John sees heaven opened and Christ sitting on a white horse, a picture in that culture of a conquering victor. He rode into Jerusalem initially on a donkey as a man of peace. And that's what kings did, by the way, in that culture. As kind of odd as it would sound, kings would ride on donkeys but when they conquered their enemy, they would ride on a white horse as a symbol of the victory that they just obtained. And so now Christ is returning from heaven, and he brings the armies of heaven with him, which include an, uh, a large uh, group of angels. We're told that in the Gospels. And then the saints of God, ten thousands of ten thousands in the book of Jude. So Christ and the armies of heaven will come back at the battle of Armageddon. And it won't be a protracted battle. It'll be over in a moment. In fact, there will be no casualties at all on the side of the Lord. All casualties will be on the side of the enemies of Christ. And an angel will call for the birds of heaven to come to feast on the supper of the Lord. So there's the marriage supper for the saints in heaven, but there's the supper of the Lord for the enemies of God who will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ, even as birds today will go and pick the dead carcasses. It is interesting that in verse... Uh, 20 of chapter 19, it says, then the beast or the Antichrist was captured. We're not told exactly how he's captured, but uh, even in today's warfare, we know you think of Saddam Hussein, it took a while to get him and they found him in a cave. But whenever there's a military victory, you, you go after the leader. And so somehow or another, it won't be a problem for the Lord, he'll capture the Antichrist and with him the false prophet, his assistant, who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. And we'll talk more about satanic deception tonight. 
and those who worshiped his image. These two, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And once you arrive there, there's no departure. Satan's going to be bound and put in a pit out of which he'll come a thousand years later. But these two don't even go to the great white throne judgment. They pass go, if you will, and go directly into the lake of fire, which is where every unbeliever will wind up. It states that towards the end of this 20th chapter. And so they'll be there forever and forever. And the rest, which would be a reference to the armies, the rest were killed with the sword or the word from the mouth of him. God, who created all things by the word of his mouth, will also destroy all evil things by the word of his mouth. His word has been placed above. God said, I've taken his word. He says, I've taken my word, which is Christ, the word of God, and I've placed him above my name. The power of the word of God to create out of nothing everything that exists and the gospel, the good news, which is the power of God unto salvation, the word of God, which has brought you and I life, the word of God, which builds us up, cleanses us, strengthens us, feeds our souls. He is the living word of God, and he kills them by the word of his mouth, him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So now in chapter 20, John continues to tell us what he saw. Then, or after that, I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished but after these things, he must be released for a little while. So first of all, John sees an angel coming down from heaven. And we would naturally say, well, who is this angel? Well, there have been a number of angels who've appeared in the book of Revelation. We are not told who this angel is. Uh, we know for certain that it is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He was just described in great detail in chapter 19, his coming there at the uh, Battle of Armageddon. And so this is a, uh, an angel who had a very significant role, as we're going to get into in a moment, but we don't know who he is. And... God uses angels. The book of Hebrews tells us in the first chapter that angels are ministering spirits. Uh, chapter 13, I believe it is actually. They're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. It's chapter 1, 2, or 13. It's in there somewhere. So angels are servants of God. Those who did not follow Satan and his rebellion they're serving the Lord in various capacities. And this angel is not given a name, though he's obviously front and center, but servants can and often are unknown or obscure. There are many servants of God whom no one knows about. They're not prominent. They're not in front of people. They don't preach from pulpits. They've never written a book Nobody cares about them in that sense because they don't know about them. They're obscure. And I believe there comes a point in any serious Christian's life where they might have started out thinking that they were God's gift to the whole world, uh, but there comes a point when they discover that that wasn't true. They are God's, they've received God's gift. They are a gift to the world, but in reality, our lives and our ministries are very obscure. 
when you think of the vastness of the globe that we live on. And we also realize that in our own power and by our own strength, we haven't really made much of an impact like we perhaps thought we would make. But we begin to settle in and to realize, I am what I am, I have what I have because God has given it to me, I am where I am because God has placed me here and God does have a will for me and my life and the purpose of my obscure, small ministry life, if you will, is to bring glory to God and let him do whatever he wants to do with my life. And I believe that uh, Christians do not have to accept that reality, but they'll be far better off if they do, because that is the truth about who each of us are. And so with increased knowledge is increased sorrow, and with increased knowledge is the wisdom that God gives us about our life. And speaking of servants, if a person is willing to not get the credit for something, God will use them. You know, Pride is hated by God. Pride is what caused the devil his problems. And pride is a constant enemy to our soul. We, uh, not pride, you know, in a job well done. That's a different story. But the pride of want, the pride of life, First John chapter 2, of wanting to be seen by people. And we, as much as we seek to be humble, uh, we battle with this. We should battle with it. But uh, a person has to learn how to come to grips with that inner desire, that inner compulsion to want to be seen and to be something in the eyes of other people. And uh, if a person is willing to let God break them to the degree that they're willing to serve without ever getting the credit for it or anybody ever knowing that it was them, God will bless them greatly. Doesn't mean that he'll put them out in the spotlight, but they will have a tremendous blessing. I remember one year when we had Franklin Graham here and we had 40,000 people that came to the crusades over the crusade over four nights and the next year believe it or not we had another crusade which is kind of unheard of and Greg Laurie came and we had the same thing another 40,000 people and I and in preparation for Greg's crusade one time months ahead I went and picked him up at uh, Fresno at the airport there and we went and had a little bite to eat and then we were driving home and and he asked me about a certain individual um whom he knew was very involved in the preparation of the crusade and so on. And I, you know, I was hoping to actually talk to him about this individual because it was bothering me greatly, and I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. But he brought it up and he said, hey, how is so-and-so doing? And I thought, well, I, I think this is, you know, the Lord's opening the door for me to kind of share. And so I was careful to not uh, demean this person, but I did express that this person was uh, one of those glory hogs, I'll call it. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I know all about that. And I said, you do? And he said, oh, yeah, I, I know all about that. And he said, don't worry about it. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I guess that's, that's all there is to do. Just don't you worry about it. But... Um, it's sad to see in ourselves when we want to have the credit. And to prove my point to you about how real our pride is, when you receive a copy of the group picture that you know you are in, who do you look for first? <laughs> uh, you look for yourself. And typically, what might you say about when you see yourself, you might say, ooh, you know, oh, look kind of overweight there, or ooh, is that how I really look? I mean, you know, it, it's just something, it's like gum on the bottom of your shoe. You got to constantly get rid of it. But may we be those people as we finish well, 
crossing the shores of eternity in that song, Beautiful, in, a, in genuine humility, wanting only to give him the glory and being happy as a lark to serve him in whatever capacity he wants to serve, he wants us to serve him in. And um, God will do that in our lives if we let him. But back to these angels just for a moment. Uh, they are servants of God to us. Uh, there are lots of angels in heaven, and, and we're not told uh, much about what they do up there. We're given some indication about the, the four creatures, the cherubim, the seraphim. We're told often about the multitude of angels, but we're not told a lot. One thing we do know is that when a Christian dies, a, person, a godly person dies, uh, that they're escorted to heaven by angels, plural. We aren't told how many there are. Um, I automatically think, well, there must be four, you know, one at each corner. There could be four million. It's a big deal when one of God's people comes home. And so since there's an innumerable company of angels, God could send a million angels to escort you to heaven. And it's a big, big deal when one of God's redeemed comes home. It's strike up the band. One of my children is coming home, and we don't stop at the gate and check with St. Peter or any of that stuff. We are welcomed into the very presence of God. And so we also know Jesus didn't give us a lot of detail, but he did say when referring to little children, he spoke of their, their angel, and we've developed terminology in the body of Christ our guardian angel, who most of us probably have a bone or two to pick with the guardian angel, like, well, uh, were you like AWOL, you know, uh, back then, or were, were you sleeping, or what were, but, but we don't know much about that, but we also have one other uh, biblical basis for knowing about the angelic world. In the Old Testament, one of the prophets, he one of his servants was concerned about the physical enemies that were coming against them. And the prophet said he wanted to encourage his assistant, so he asked God to open the eyes of his assistant, and God did. And he said, my Lord, he, said he could see into the invisible world, and he said, there are more that are with us than are with them. And so God's strategic organization of his angels in the angelic world, the things not seen, there could be angels floating around, not floating, that's how we think of them, but there could be, there no doubt are angels here this evening. They're, they're everywhere in the world doing God's bidding. Maybe they were the one that caused your car to go just one inch to the right that time and you avoided a head-on collision. Or maybe he caused you to move just a little bit when a bullet went right by your head. You say, well, what about the other times when there wasn't that movement? Well, God has a plan. But anyways, he says, then I saw an angel. He was coming down from heaven, and he had the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. We do know that only good things, we're told in the book of James, come down from heaven. And here is this angel coming down from heaven, heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So these two things, the key and the chain. And of course, bottomless pit is not a reference to our stomachs. Uh, but if you look with me to the book of Luke, please, chapter 8, this bottomless pit is mentioned a number of times in the Bible, most of them in the book of Revelation. But in Luke chapter 8, in verse 30, actually, we'll just start in verse 26. It says in, eight, in Luke 8, 26, then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped on, out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city 
who had demons for a long time. This was an unsaved man who was uh, demon-possessed. He had multiple demons in him. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but he lived in tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? So he humbled himself, recognizing the authority of Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He said, you're the most son of the most high. He asked him, what have I to do with you? And then he, he said, I beg you, do not torment me. So he understood the power of Christ and the torment that might come upon him. Uh, verse 29, for he, Jesus, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Then Jesus, then Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. So there the demons know of this, uh, it's a buso in the Greek, this abyss, this bottomless pit. And then if you go please with me to Revelation chapter 9, and very quickly, we'll just look at a couple of times when this bottomless pit is mentioned. Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says in Revelation 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall, fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And this would, of course, have been the enemy, Satan. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And then in chapter 11 of Revelation, in verse 7, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, it says, Now when they finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So, and then in chapter 17, verse 8, Revelation 17, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition or to destruction and so on. So we've read about this bottomless pit before, but now we see that it's being used as a prison for the devil himself. Verse 1 of chapter 20, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, where is the, what is this bottomless pit? Um, I don't know. Where, I don't know what it is other than what is stated. Where is this bottomless pit? I don't know. Many people believe it is found in the center of the earth. That's a commonly held belief by Bible scholars. And in fact, it is a location, and it very well could be a bottomless pit. And how it's bottomless, I, I've heard efforts to explain that. I don't know, but it is a location. And what happens is, in verse 2, that this unnamed angel, it says, he laid hold of the dragon. That's one name given to Satan. That serpent of old, that's another name given to him. Who is the devil, that's a third name. And Satan, that's a fourth name. And bound him for a thousand years. So, he laid hold of him, which means that the devil was, or excuse me, that he was arrested is basically the meaning of that. The word dragon there in describing uh, Satan uh, literally means a dragon or a great serpent, and it is simply in the Bible a name for Satan. The word devil, which is used here, means malicious gossips. It speaks of slanderous, 
accusing falsely. Uh, the devil is a false accuser, as we're going to read in a few moments. He is prone to slander. He is slanderous. Um, he's, a, he's just a slanderer. He slanders God. He slanders you, and so on and so forth. And then we look at the word Satan, which means the adversary. Satan is your adversary, or one who opposes another in purpose or act. You have a purpose. You're seeking to act, to follow Christ. The devil is opposed to your purpose in following Christ. He is an adversary of God, an adversary of Christ, he incites apostasy from God into sin. He encourages people away from Christ. So when you know even people who are not saved, but they're starting to get saved, they're starting to have their eyes open, but they get pulled away, no doubt the devil's been in there pulling them away. Or you see in Christians who uh, are walking with the Lord and then they get pulled away. They've perhaps given heed to doctrines of demons, some type of satanic influence uh, leading them away, inciting them. And by the way, when you go away from God, there's only one place to go, that is to sin. It's one or the other. He is a trick, he's a tricker. He, he uh, causes people to worship idols, uh, those who are under his control wind up living for the things of this world, idolatry. His demons are able to take possession of men and inflict them with diseases. Um, he can possess not a believer, but an unbeliever. He can afflict even a believer with diseases. He did that to Job. And by God's assistance, he is overcome. And he's being bound here. But Jesus described uh, Satan, and we'll, we'll look at that description in just a little bit. But those are names that are given to him. I, I, I find it interesting that he's an accusing adversary. He's a slanderous adversary. So, you know, it, when this is something that God hates, by the way. In the book of Proverbs, it says, these things God hates, yea, seven. And the last one is, he that causes division. All through Proverbs, it talks about tail bearers, backbiting, so on and so forth. When we get involved in gossip, which we love to get involved in, I mean, if, I, if, if you guys are going to sleep tonight and I say, hey, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? I guarantee you, you will pick up like volts of electricity just went through your body. Is that? Mm. You know, tail bearing is like a sweet morsel. It goes down into the depths of our being. We like to hear the bad news about other people. We have a vicarious experience in hearing of how horrible they are. And it's horrible for us to participate in gossip and slander. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a place in our lives uh, to sit down objectively in humility with a counselor, somebody where you're trying to, you know, figure out what's going on with this person. That's not gossiping. But so often in prayer meetings, oh, Lord, I want to pray for my brother so-and-so, who, as you know, Lord, was out drinking last night and, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. But when you, when we get involved in slandering other people, we're participating in an adversarial role. We're helping to put a wedge into the body of Christ between that person and God. And the best thing to do, if and it takes a lot of faith and a lot of humility and courage to not participate in it because the people who want you to participate in it are usually friends of yours or people you know. And it's hard to kind of say no to a friend. But one way that you can be prepared to not participate in it is to say, oh, could, could you hold on just a second? Let's just pray. Lord, we just want to pray. You know the needs of, the, of this man or this woman, and thank you that you love them, and we pray, Lord, that you would help them and bless them in Jesus' name. Hey, let's go get a cup of coffee or something. 
That's a nice, real way. It's not just mouthing words. You're actually praying. But it sets an example, by the way, and it probably will maybe bring some conviction. Probably maybe don't go together. It could bring some conviction into the life of the person who is gossiping. Now, if that doesn't work, you just smack them a little bit. and say, Stop that. <laughs> but Satan is an accuser. He's your adversary. But he's going to be arrested by this angel, and he's going to be put in that bottomless pit for 1,000 years. That's the millennial period. In verse 3, it says, And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. So he tumbles into that jail cell, and he's shut up in there. The, the, the door to the prison, if you will, is closed. And it says a seal was set upon him. Uh, maybe it's like a lock, and there's no way for him to get out of there. But the purpose of him being placed here is listed for us in the second part of verse 3. So that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, the thousand years, he must be released for a little while. Now, we'll talk about his being released for a little while next week, but I want to draw your attention to why he's being placed in there and what it is that he does so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are up. Now, the word deceive there means to cause to wander, to cause to wander or to go astray or to be misguided or misled or uh, straying off of the path or wandering. It comes from a word meaning uh, deluding or error. He has a global ministry of causing people to wander from the truth because it says that he should deceive the nations no more. If you'll turn with me to John, please, chapter 8, very quickly. John chapter 8. Jesus gives us a very detailed description uh, of the devil. John chapter 8 in verse 44. Actually, in verse 42, Jesus said to them, these were the Pharisees who were engaged in um, calling him um, an illegitimate child. They were accusing his mother of being pregnant outside of marriage and so on. And Because in verse 41, we're not born of fornication. So they were putting him down. And then Jesus said to them in verse 42, if, if God were your father, you would love me. And loving God, of course, is one of the hallmarks of being a Christian. For I proceeded forth and came from God. If you want to know where I came from, I came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Here's the answer, because you are not able to listen to my word. So if you've ever wondered why some people you know don't understand the word of God, it's because they're not able to listen to the word of God. It doesn't make any sense to them. It bothers them. It's a waste of their time. Uh, they would rather be doing something else. Their minds are blinded. They cannot understand the word of God until God begins to open their eyes. And in verse 44, notice what Jesus says about these people who were not of God. He says, you are of your father, the devil. How about that? And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. 
That's a scripture to mark. You know, people today make fun of the devil, and I think on that show uh, years ago, what was it called? Uh, that, what was it? That was then or whatever. You old people out there. Flip Wilson, you know, the devil on one side, an angel on the other. You remember that? This was the week that was or something. He would make fun of the devil and, you know, an angel and a bad de devil. And so, you know, quietly, uh, a whole generation, you know, kind of got a warped view of Satan. He's not a figment of anybody's imagination. He's a very real, powerful being. He is the God of this world. And people, he is the father of people. The spirit of the God of this world dwells in the children of disobedience and wrath. There is no such thing as a free spirit. They may think they're free because they're doing whatever they want to do. They're actually destroying themselves. They're underneath the power of Satan. And he's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. How does he deceive? Well, he can't tell the truth. He doesn't tell the truth. He is a liar. He has doctrines. We're told in 1 Timothy 4, people will give heed to the doctrines of demons. He is against the truth of Christ. He will tell you that sin is better than Jesus. He'll tell you that God won't judge you. God loves you. He'll tell you that God's words are not true. He told that to Adam and Eve. He teaches philosophy that accomplishes nothing. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, we are warned that if we're angry, not to let the sun go down upon our wrath, nor give place to the devil, which means don't give the devil a foothold in your life by continuing in sin. One of the best ways to stand against the enemy is to repent, to confess our sins, and to repent of them. But if a child of God uh, determines to walk in known sin, you're giving the devil a foothold in your life. So now you're not only dealing with your own sin, but you have, and it's not defined for us in any way, but you have demonic influence working against you. In fact, if you look with me to the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 for just a moment, 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 24, it says, and, and a servant of the Lord, 2 Timothy 2, 24, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Now that's, you know, that's, it would appear, uh, is speaking contextually of uh, unbelievers. However, uh, believers can be in opposition to God as well, and believers need repentance. In verse 26, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So that could be referencing an unbeliever. It could be speaking of a believer to some degree, but the ways in which Satan works. Paul, Peter said he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the demonic global influence will come to an end for a thousand years. Can you imagine? You'll be able to leave your keys in your car. You're saying, will there be cars during the millennium? Of course there'll be cars. Uh, you won't have to lock your house up. Of, There'll be houses, of course there'll be houses. This isn't the mansions in glory. This is living on the, the uh, earth with Christ, and we'll get into that a little bit more next week as well. There'll be no theft, there'll be no abortion, there'll be no murder, there'll be no lying, there'll be no 
uh, problems. There'll be no wars. The lamb and the lion will lay down together. All the weapons will be, you know, melted down and used for uh, agricultural work. It's going to be a, it's going to be uh, the Garden of Eden on steroids. I mean, it really is going to be. And the reason it's going to be like that is twofold. Number one, Satan is going to be bound. Number two, Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron. He will not allow what currently is going on in the world to go on. The one question I have is, well, what about all of the demons that work with Satan? They're not listed here. Um, all we can, uh, I can only, for me, assume that when he puts Satan in this prison, in some way he is also going to restrict the activity of the demons because there's not going to, going to be the things that I mentioned. They won't be. It's going to be from darkness to light. Well, you know, uh, Quickly, let's go on to verse 4, please, in Revelation 20. The next thing that John sees, he says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them. The they are not listed for us here just yet, but he said, I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So clearly the last group are the martyrs of the tribulation. In fact, the ones who are on the thrones, it seems to be they, that that's a little bit of a different group or it could be the martyrs. It, it makes no difference. But we now see uh, thrones and judgment. We see the horrible, we see the relief of the horribleness of what was done to these people and the courage and the faith and the power of God's grace which kept them from worshiping the enemy. And at the end of verse 4, it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So uh, again, you have the thousand-year millennium uh, being uh, mentioned here. They, they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And we're going to reign with him. But the rest of the dead... Now, who are the rest of the dead? Well, the rest of the dead would be the wicked dead who will be raised and judged after the millennium. So the bodies of these people will be raised, they'll be glorified. Notice in verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This group of saints. And then notice what it says about those in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Why? Over such the second death has no power. And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. But they shall be priests to God they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the blessing, it says, blessed and holy is he who is part of this first res resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. What is the second death? Well, if you go over to the last part of chapter 20, verse 14, it says, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So all those who are raised in the first resurrection, which, by the way, would include every Old Testament saint and all the saints in the New Testament, just the lock, stock, and barrel, everybody's raised up. 
and we're said to reign with Christ, to rule with Christ. And I'm certain this will be our reigning and ruling with Christ will be part of uh, our, our, our uh, responsibilities won't all be the same because our uh, rewards won't all be the same. We'll be rewarded differently for our faithfulness to God, but we will all be priests, and the function of a priest is twofold. One, it's to represent the people to God. You say, well, what people would we be representing? Well, there will be people who will come into the millennial, the millennial period who lived through all of the tribulation. They're not going to be raised to, up because they're still alive. And those people will reproduce just like people reproduce today, and they'll have a thousand years to reproduce. So, you know, when you start talking about exponential growth, uh, it happens pretty quickly. We will be representing those people to the Lord who's reigning in Jerusalem. And we will, the second aspect of a priest is that he represents the Lord to the people. So what a glorious, glorious future. We, and this is all before we actually wind up in heaven, by the way. This is during the thousand-year reign. That's what's coming. So next week, we'll pick it up in verse 7, okay? And, and so I didn't, I only, I did what I said I was going to do tonight, right? I said we're going to, Lord willing, do these six verses. So uh, there you go. Um, but I did want to mention to you, if you have this little piece of blue paper in your bulletin, uh, we're, we are developing a database so that we can uh, communicate with you, not bother you, but communicate with you things that are important. So if you've changed your address, your email, your phone number, or you don't think you're getting any emails from the church, would you please fill one of these out? And then also, we are having our our Acts 242 Wednesday is going to be happening now on the 20th of September. We're pushing it off a week. And the topic that evening is going to be baptism. You know, we've been really digging into important doctrinal realities out of the book of Acts chapter 2. And that night, we're going to be teaching what is baptism. And I would like to encourage you if you are a Christian, but you've never been baptized. Now listen, please, carefully. You may have been baptized before you were a Christian as a little baby or whatever, but from the time you were saved, if you've not been baptized, you really ought to. Baptism is to accompany your salvation. Your pre-baptism was nice, and everybody might have had a good feeling, but it meant absolutely nothing. I mean, God didn't, you know, condemn you for it, but really, are you, are you with me? Yes. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that, because sometimes I wonder, am I making any sense? That's what my wife says to me. Would you make some sense, please? No, she doesn't. And then also, coming up on the 24th of September, a Sunday morning, we're going to have one service at 9 o'clock, um, no cafe that morning. We wanted to kind of let you know one service, combined service. Uh, there will be child care that morning, but we're calling it Vision Sunday. And by Vision Sunday, it's simply, it's not like some new program or anything, but it's just to share the things that are, that are happening here, uh, encouragement at the, uh, for the days ahead, uh, exhortation to you, um, and it'll be a delightful time for our church congregation. So please, uh, if you are a member of the body, uh, please make sure, if you can, to come on the 24th because um, it'll be a wonderful morning. It'll, it's just going to be a super-duper time. I'm not sure who is doing announcements this evening. Philip, he's got a few more things, and so we're doing good with time. Let's welcome Philip, please. Thank you.